Well, friends, what a joy that you've chosen to join us in worship. Today actually is Mother's Day here in the United States. We know we have people joining from this nation and around the globe. And a great reminder that as we come to this moment, there are remarkable women that God has used beyond just biological mothers to mother the church. We're gonna discover one of them today as we get to God's word. But before we do so, let's lift up our voices, lift up our hearts to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And may God bless you in this hour of worship. This may be a song that the captives can't yet sing But if we sing long enough, they might join in with us This may be a dance that's too heavy for those chains But if we dance long enough, all the prisons will open up hey!
Well, friends, what a special day in worship as we are gathered here today. And this is Mother's Day that we celebrate in the U.S. And we come to this moment not only in worship online, but also many people will be listening to this after the fact. And every single Mother's Day, we as a church and many churches around the nation and globe acknowledge uh, the, the complexities of Mother's Day. You know, on one hand, we have women in our lives who we profoundly celebrate Uh, I think about my mom, for example, what a gift she is. In so many ways, I can't even wrap human language around. No one person in my life has been more transformative than my mother, and I celebrate with her on this day. And many of you have people in your lives, whether uh, alive or who have passed away, that you look on fondly and you celebrate on this Mother's Day. However, there is another reality on Mother's Day where there is this heaviness, there is this weightiness for a variety of reasons, and we want to acknowledge that, uh, that on this day, as Scripture calls us, we rejoice with those that rejoice and grieve with those who grieve. For some of us, we don't have a relationship with our mother, or if we do, it is a broken one, and this day doesn't necessarily feel like a day worth celebrating. There's some who have wanted to be mothers for many years and for whatever reason have not been able to do so. Many of you know the story of my wife and I and our many years of infertility. And in that season, there were days and there were Mother's Days where it was very difficult for us to even show up to church because of how much it reminded us of the the longing that hadn't yet been fulfilled in our own lives. And so what I want to do today is actually a special, special message on a particular mother of the church. No, I'm not talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. I want to speak about the remarkable life of Henrietta Mears. As we do in every sermon, we go to God's word, but I'm going to wait until the very end of this message to go to God's word. But what I want to do is remind us that there are remarkable women that we see not only throughout the 66 books of the Bible, But throughout the last 2,000 years of church history, that God has used in powerful ways to accomplish God's purposes. Over the years, I've done sermons on uh, the life of Lydia, for example, who was the founder and planter of the church in Philippi. This remarkable truth that God used a woman in the first century to be the leader and the founder, the church planter of that great church of which Paul writes to the Uh, church in Philippi in his letter to the Philippians, there is no more joyful letter than Philippians and to know that Lydia is at its foundation. I think about Timothy's life and how he talks about uh, his grandmother uh, Eunice and his mother Lois and how formative they were in transforming his life, as the Apostle Paul reminds him. There are so many women that God lifts up and establishes a remarkable truth that in the first century, There was never women who were followers of rabbis, and yet Jesus, for the first time, allowed women to be his disciples. You have many of them who were named throughout Scripture. In fact, it was the women who were the last to stay at the cross while all the other men left. It was women who first saw Jesus in his resurrected form. This remarkable truth that God embraces God's humanity. And in a world, we need that reminder. And there are many people who I could talk about Over the course of 2,000 years, there are women who God has used in every continent around the globe. But I want to talk about Henrietta Mears for many reasons, including the unique role that she has played in this church, Bel Air Church. But before we get to her life, it's really important to understand the context in which she lived. This was the beginning of the 20th century. And in the United States, there was the forces of many, many things that were pulling on, tugging on the fabric of American lives. And during that time, there was two large forces within the Christian faith that began to rise up, that actually began to pull apart the church from the center. There was a fundamentalist movement that started to raise up that was very anti-intellectual, that was very critical of culture, that was very judgmental of culture, that really took a position of being set apart and removed from culture. It was very condemning. It was very harsh. And there was this huge movement in the early 20th century in the Christian church of fundamentalism rising up. 
And at the same time, and in some ways in response to fundamentalism, there was a, a, a modern, you can call it progressive or liberalism that began to rise up, that began to question some of the core tenets of the Christian faith, such as the divinity of Christ, uh, the existence of miracles, the authority of scripture. And it seemed like these two forces actually began to stir one another up and push the ends even further and further and further apart. Doesn't it sound like today? Well, in the midst of this rise of the margins, of the extremes, there was what I would call faithful ones who walked that line of following Jesus, being culturally engaged, following Jesus as not just their Savior, but also Lord, and paving, paving a third way interdenominationally that actually tried to bridge the extremes to bring them together. And Henrietta Mears was a formidable force that many of you have no idea how instrumental she was in being the mother of the church in the lives of so many millions of people around the globe, including this church. In fact, it was in 1928 that she chose to leave her church in Minneapolis. It was a Baptist church. She began to be concerned about the fundamentalism that was rising up within that church, the anti-intellectualism that says, you know, we need to not uh, expose ourselves to any academic books. We need to not listen to science. She was concerned by that and actually left that church and moved to Hollywood, California. In fact, First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood was where she was hired in 1928. And I want you to hear this kind of overarching summary of her life before I go into five things that I want to share that enabled her to be a remarkable mother of the church that I believe no matter who you are, that we too can be people who can step into the call of God in our lives, that God can commission us for a season and a time such as this, and whether you are a mother or not, that you can play a significant role in leading the church into the future. Let me read this. This is from one of the many biographies of Henrietta Mears. I've read a number of them over the last six months, and this is a, a wonderful overview. I want you to just sit in and uh, prepare yourself for this vast overview. It's a longer section, but just to take in this overview of her life. When she arrived, I quote, in Hollywood from Minneapolis in 1928, the massive sanctuary had just recently been completed. The communicant membership hovered just above 2,100 people. And on any given Sunday, attendance at the church's Sunday school averaged 450. However, many years later, when the church hosted her memorial service, 35 years later, the Sunday school under her care was purported to be the largest in the Presbyterian church around the globe, and one of the 10 largest Protestant Sunday schools in the entire nation. In the half century between 1913, when she was in Minneapolis, and 1963, where she retired, Hollywood, Mears either originated, actively participated in, or significantly inspired a formidable array of organizations that would transform Christianity in the United States. Earlier than any other 20th century American Protestant, she shaped the contours of what would become known as the modern evangelical movement. Again, just as an aside, this is long before it became politicized. This was a culturally engaged origin story of a third way that was neither fundamental or liberal. It marked this third way that was grounded in God's word, following Jesus, culturally engaged, and it continues on. Mears founded a successful publishing company named Gospel Light that grew into one of the country's largest independent religious publishing houses whose products serviced a global clientele. She negotiated the purchase of a Southern California resort, which under her guidance became a major interdenominational conference center that today hosts upward of 60,000 participants annually in multiple sites. It's known as Forest Home. It's where I've worked. It's where my faith was renewed. In fact, it's where we're having our church camp this summer. She was the founder 
of Forest Home goes on. She authored Sunday school curricula used by thousands of churches, not people, thousands of churches around the world and helped launch the first formal organized ministry to the entertainment industry in Hollywood. She administered deputation services, programs that were created initially for Christian youth to help underserved populations in Southern California, but eventually expanded to encompass other areas of need, including war-ravaged Europe and Asia. She was an early leader of the National Association of Evangelicals, serving as a charter member of the Association's Commission on International Relations and a seminal force behind the formation, listen to this, of the National Sunday School Association. If you've ever grown up in church, if you've ever been to Sunday school or heard about Sunday school, she was one of the founders of the concept of Sunday school. In fact, she created a nonprofit foundation to strengthen Christian education programs worldwide. She trained indigenous leaders using their own languages around the globe. She was a sought after speaker. She regularly addressed audiences around the country and overseas on topics ranging from Christian youth work and leadership to church growth and evangelism. She carved only enough time out of her hectic schedule to author short articles, but her collected lesson materials and related notes have been in print since their release in book form. More than four million copies of her most popular volume, What the Bible is All About, circulate today in at least four different editions and countless languages. Mears developed close relationships with celebrities such as film stars Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, Jane Russell, Colleen Townsend, remember that name for later, and recording artists Tim Spencer, Red Harper, and Connie Haynes. She directly or indirectly influenced prominent Protestant icons such as Stuart Hablin, James Oliver Buswell Jr., Harold John Ockengay, Harold Lindsell, Dawson Trotman, and Roberta Hessens, and she collaborated with Cameron Townsend, the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators, and Bob Pierce, who was the architect of both World Vision and Samaritan's Purse. She counted West Coast governors Arthur Langley from Washington, Mark Hatfield from Oregon, and Goodwin Knight, California, among her supporters. Listen to this, excluding his mother and wife, Evangelist Billy Graham called her the greatest female influence on his life and one of the greatest Christians that Billy Graham ever knew. This is Henrietta Mears. Bill Bright, founder of the International Ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now known as Crew, patterned his life work on principles he gleaned from Henrietta Mears. Jim Rayburn, the visionary behind the Young Life, campaign. If you've heard of Young Life, it's all around the nation. He fashioned his ministry among high school students around what he learned from Henrietta. Dr. Wilbur Smith, who co-founded Fuller Theological Seminary, where I've received my MDiv, where all of our pastoral team has received their MDiv, one of the most influential seminaries around the globe that actually services more denominations and is the most globally and ethnically diverse seminary in the world, he said this, he said that she is the most inspiring woman leader in Christian causes that I have ever known. Nearly 400 students from her renowned Hollywood Presbyterian College Department went into full-time Christian ministry, and hundreds more emerged as important civic and business leaders who served local churches as lay people but were also the hands and feet of Jesus in their industries and in their places of work. And as a church family, 67 years in, we talk about following Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. We talk about being a church at work. And I want to, again, as a reminder, to pause for a moment and to reflect on the life of Henrietta Mears. And I want you to be reminded, actually, of how she focused her life and the multiplying impact that that had that spans the globe but also what that meant for them today, or for them back then and us today to be the church at work, and remarkably for you to understand a little bit more about the origin story of this church, Bel Air Church. All right, so there's five things that she patterned her entire ministry off of, and I wanna walk one by one these themes you've heard me talk about. 
you've heard our pastoral team talk about, and we'll tie them into quotes that she gave and into scripture. And my hope and my prayer is that you would be encouraged on this day, that you would be inspired on this day, and ultimately that you would be reminded that God is calling you for such a time as this to be part of what God is doing in the world, to be part of God's global movement, not only here in Los Angeles, but to the ends of the earth. All right, so these five things that she patterned uh, her whole ministry off of. Number one, the number one goal was to lead each person to an acceptance of Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Number two, to bring each life into vital relationship with the transforming Word of God from the youngest to the oldest. Number three, the formation of Christian ideals of character and conduct. Number four, the expression of Christian life in missionary and service enterprises and recreational activities. And fifth and finally, to bring people to recognize the Lordship of Christ. These five goals, when operationalized through the five I wills of teachers that she raised up, became the core assumptions about which she pattern her life and ministry after. So what I want to do is I just simply want to walk through each of them one by one. So the first is this, to lead each one to an acceptance of Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. This is what the entirety of her life was all about. In quote, she says this, the Christian life is not just about trying to be good or trying to just be like Jesus, imitating him. It is seeking to have a deep and profound experience of fellowship with Christ. She knew that this wasn't about behavior modification. This wasn't about intellectual knowledge. This wasn't about anything other than developing and cultivating a personal relationship with Jesus, first and foremost, as Savior. It's remarkable that the five have a through line of Christ, but they are bookended by Jesus as Savior, and fifth, Jesus as Lord. These two realities are things that we can swing a pendulum. We can be all about Jesus as Lord and we want to follow him and we want to obey him and we want to model our life after him, but we must never forget that it must first begin with Jesus as our Savior. At the beginning of every discipling relationship in her life was a reminder that you are deeply and profoundly loved by God. That there's nothing that you could ever do to measure up, that there's nothing in the course of your life, even in the five steps that actually earns God's love in your life. But ultimately there is this profound truth that, as it says in the book of Romans, that God demonstrates his love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In fact, Romans 10 Verses 9 and 10 were instrumental in me, Drew, the pastor of Bellard Church, coming to faith actually as a college student at the University of Southern California. My roommate, in fact, he talked to me over the course of being friends with him, that he saw in my life this desire to grow in Christ. But ultimately, he says, Drew, according to my understanding of Scripture, you, you, you seem to not yet be a follower of Jesus because it seems like, Drew, you are trying to save yourself and it seems like you're trying to be the Lord of your own life. And he says, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it begins with this reality that we need saving. In some ways, the backdrop of the early 20th century as they moved through the Great Depression after World War I, as they moved into World War II with the threat of nuclear war, uh, with the concerns of not only uh, economic fallout, but nuclear fallout. Uh, It was a time where there was great concern and there was profound movements that happened in our nation and around the globe. And she knew that the hope for all of humanity was found in Jesus that it wasn't a program, that it wasn't about moral behavior, it wasn't about an invention, it wasn't about who was sitting in the roles of authority as a mayor, as a governor, as a president, as a king or a queen. 
She purposely chose not to focus her energy in political endeavors, but rather focused everything on helping people come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. In fact, she modeled everything off of this. She goes on to write. She says this, that Christ should be the center and the circumference of Christian education. As she sought to teach the Bible, ultimately to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There was more people who were attending the Sunday school classes than there were the main services. And as she led the Christian education, as she also led the college group, there were upwards of 6,000 young people on a weekly basis coming to learn. And for her, it was all about Jesus. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, as she empowered and trained her teachers to teach the Bible, again, as a reminder, the center and the circumference is all about Jesus. Now, for some of us who don't know the Bible, that might sound surprising. We might say, wait a second, I, you know, the Old Testament, uh, I don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. And it seems, doesn't Jesus just come onto the scene in the New Testament? Well, in actual fact, as you study the life of Jesus, you begin to see that Jesus is pointing back in time to the fullness of the Hebrew scriptures. And he says, ultimately, that all of it is about him because Jesus is not just a teacher. He is not just a leader. He's not just a great person. This is God in the flesh, one of three persons in the one being that is the eternal Godhead. Jesus has eternally coexisted as the word of God made flesh, as the son of God, as the savior of the world. And what a great reminder for us today on this Mother's Day or whenever we see it, that all of life begins with how we respond to Jesus asking the question, who do you say that I am? And my hope and my prayer is that before we move on to the next steps that you would acknowledge in your life, have you received Jesus as your savior? Or is he just someone who is helping you in your life? Uh, is Jesus someone that you're curious about? There is this great reminder that he's come to you out of love, longing to be in a relationship with you, to make a way where there is no way, to cover over any brokenness, to remind you that you are loved by God and you can receive that by faith today. And the Henrietta Mears, her entire ministry began with that. The Jesus as Savior. Another amazing quote from her is that she was all about knowing Christ and making him known. In fact, this was the motto of the college group. In fact, there's, there's many ministries, there's nonprofits, there's churches who have adopted this, this tagline, this motto as their tagline, as their motto, and it originated with Henrietta Mears, to know Christ and to make him known. To know is all about relationship. This is not just an intellectual pursuit, but it is a relationship that can be cultivated in every area of your life. And ultimately, she said that the field of Christian education, first and foremost, should introduce men, women, and children to Christ as Savior. And then second, to train them in the Word of God. This is where it moves to that second step. Her goal... Number two was to bring each life into vital relationship with the transforming word of God from the youngest to the oldest. And again, I want you to hear her language. What she said is she wants to help people enter into a relationship with the word of God from the youngest to the oldest. What she didn't say was, I want people to know the Word of God or to study the Word of God or to be able to ace a Bible content exam. No, she says to help people enter into a relationship with the Word of God. It is this beautiful reminder that this text isn't dead, it is alive. In fact, we can be impacted by many stories there is remarkable work that has been put out by humanity that can shape us, that can transform us, that can inspire us, that can humble us. But there's only one text that we can truly have a relationship with, and that's the living word of God. In fact, as it says in the Gospel of John, verse 1, in chapter 1, 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And we have beheld his glory, the glory of an only son. This is Jesus, full of grace and truth, the gospel writer John says. And she recognized that as it begins with a relationship with Jesus as Savior, the next is to move into a relationship with the Word of God from youngest to oldest. And so she patterned a ministry in a Christian education that was cradle roll to grave, as she called it. And she knew that what a one-year-old had capacity for was different than what a 10-year-old had capacity for than a 40-year-old, than an 80-year-old, than a 100-year-old had capacity for. And there was age and stage appropriate content that she developed, that she shepherded, that she oversaw, that ultimately helped people have a relationship. That this was something that they encountered relationally. What a great reminder for us. You know, we can go to God's Word and we can forget that behind these words is a one who loves us, who adores us, who wants to communicate to us. And as we move throughout this life, what a great reminder that we need to get into relationships where we can study God's word and ultimately be in relationship with the word of God, the living God, the one who wants to communicate with us. There are many ministries that are phenomenal around the world. And those ministries that help us understand God's word are things that we have at our disposal. She also knew, Henrietta did, how important it was for life-on-life -life discipleship. Rather than just giving a textbook and saying, okay, I want you to go study it and then come back a year later, let me know. It was relationally walked through, talked through, questions could be asked. And in addition to those large group settings, there were follow-ups. And so here we are in 2023, we actually have more access to great Bible teaching than we ever have in the history of humanity. And yet at the same time, studies show that in many ways, we know God's word less than we ever have on average. And there is one thing about the convenience of what we're doing right now that can actually cause us to think, oh, I'll just check in next week. I'll just check in next month or we just have this uh, self-motivated pursuit of following a relationship with Jesus, but ultimately when we enter into a relationship with someone else, it enables us to ask questions, to be encouraged when we're discouraged. When we get to places in the Bible like Leviticus, if we're reading through scripture and we wanna just close it up and say, forget this, we can enter in and actually discover the richness and the truth and the beauty and in fact, as a church family, we have so many ways in which you can have a relationship with the Word of God in the context of community. One of those is life groups. In fact, if you were to go to belair.org forward slash life groups right now, we always have open groups that you can join in different seasons. We go through content related to a particular sermon series that we provide for you right now in this season. We also have many other resources that you can study, whether it's a book or a book of the Bible, but ultimately whether you gather in person on our physical campus or you gather in person at a home around Los Angeles, or as we are wanting to grow up groups that meet in homes around this nation and around the world, we're looking not just for participants, but also for facilitators of those groups. And finally, we also have groups that meet digitally, online. No matter what time zone you're in, there's this great opportunity to be part of community studying God's word. In addition, we are launching something this fall called Bethel. It's something that we've had for many, many years, and it's a study, a two-year study through all of scripture. All 66 books taking two years in community to go through, whether you join in person or you join online, it is a great opportunity. And if you were to go to belair.org, you can actually look under classes to discover how you can register for Bethel. But Henry and Amir, she knew, first and foremost, it was all about Jesus as Savior. Second, it was about bringing each life into vital relationship with the transforming Word of God from the youngest to the oldest. She would say the Bible is our only textbook, the cross is our only power, and Christ Supreme is our only motto, and that leads to the third 
focus of her life and ministry, the formation of Christian ideals of character and conduct. I love this one quote that she says that sums it up. She says, we are called to live the gospel first and then tell about it afterwards. You see, there can be this temptation that we either keep private our life in relationship with God, that we don't actually move out into the world and look different than the rest of the world, that how we work, how we engage on social media, how we interact with our neighbors uh, isn't shaped or formed by Jesus Christ and his teachings. There can be this temptation to just keep things private, to not go public with our faith, Or we can swing the pendulum so far the other way that we are constantly talking about Jesus and proclaiming Jesus with our lips, but not with our lives. There can be a hypocrisy of judgmentalism that is pointing the finger saying, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. But then the interior of the character of our lives is no different than anybody else. And she paved a third way, which was to live the gospel first. She said that out of the overflow of a relationship with Jesus and out of the overflow of a relationship with the Word of God, that our exterior life should be transformed, where we become more patient people, where we become more forgiving people, more gracious people, more just people. In all the ways that the fruit of the Spirit can manifest itself in our life, That is out of the overflow of a relationship with God. You see, she put this one third and not first because she knew that transformation only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit that comes as a result of a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, this idea of living the gospel first and then telling about it afterwards reminds me of a a quote that has often been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, Uh, which is to preach the gospel always, and if necessary, if you must, use words. You see, the reality of your life and the reality of my life is that our life communicates something. And ultimately, every single person has a savior, has a center, has a circumference that shapes how we speak, that shapes our decisions, that shapes our actions, that shapes how we see ourselves, how we see other people. And these forces that are out there in the world can be our center, can be our circumference. And ultimately, she called people with a high calling that Jesus would be our center, that Jesus would be our circumference, and that in every area of our life, out of the overflow of that, that we would live as followers of Jesus and people would see that, that they would ask questions. And as a church family, when we long to be the church at work, we talk about church being more than just an hour on Sunday, more than just a building. In fact, church is a Greek word, ekklesia, the called out ones. And in fact, every image, every metaphor, every description of the called out ones, the church in scripture in the New Testament is basically this. It's a community of people who are defined by the reality of who Jesus is. That's what it means to be the church. It's more than just the pastors, the elders, the leaders, the members. We are all collectively the ecclesia, the church. And we're just one local church among many amazing churches in Los Angeles, among many amazing churches around this nation, one of many amazing churches around the globe. And ultimately, there is the local expression of the church, the body of Christ, the called out ones. And there is also the global and historical church. And we are called to be a church at work. And we mean work not just in our workplaces, but first and foremost, the verb. There's there's activity. There's work that we are collectively called to do. To love God with everything, to love our neighbors ourselves. To be people who are patient in the world who are extending justice in the world, who are being a voice for the voiceless in the world, who are caring for widows and orphans in their distress, who are practicing the one another's of Scripture, loving one another, forgiving one another, bearing one another's burdens, confessing our sins to one another so that we can edify and lift up one another, bearing with one another in love, respecting one another. There's so much work that we are called to do, and Henry and Amir's catched and caught that vision and 
sent that out to the people in her midst in this glorious truth that it's not just the work that we do, but it's in our places of work where the real transformation happens when we first live out the gospel. And this is why she was really paving a third way. You know, in many ways, there was uh, these poles of the extremes, like I said in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, fundamentalists were very anti-culture, especially anti-Hollywood. And she entered in, and she loved people, cared for people, embraced people. And she longed for them to come to a saving relationship with Jesus. She longed for them to experience a relationship with the Word of God. And she longed for them to be transformed so that their lives communicated the gospel. And as I read earlier, she was the founder of the first ministry to Hollywood. And there was transformative things that happened behind the scenes that shaped how things happened on movie sets, that shaped how things were sent out from Hollywood around the globe. And one of those people was Colleen Townsend. I mentioned that name earlier. Well, she was actually very involved, ultimately in the church, of First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. And she was one of many people who began to see her life and her calling as one that could be lived out wherever she went, including in her acting career. There were many other politicians that ultimately began to shape how they led to be Christ-centered, not the other way around, which sadly things have become, where we contort Christianity to fit some political agenda. No, this was reverse, where political agendas were submitted to the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ in ways that reflected God's heart. And ultimately, this beautiful thing resulted in the fourth area, where it was the expression of Christian life in missionary and service enterprises and recreational activities. She said, the outer life is that expression of life that makes Christ known to others. In fact, unlike many of the fundamentalists in the early 20th century that were very anti-intellectual, she said this, that one of her greatest concerns was, quote, not that students would lose their faith as they pursued higher education, but rather it was that they would not pursue enough education to prepare them adequately for their vocations as believers in a secularizing world. She said this was the greatest textbook. She didn't say it was the only textbook. And this being the greatest textbook actually shaped how we interpreted all other textbooks. She encouraged people to get higher degrees. She entered into profound ways the, the college campuses of both UCLA and USC. She, in fact, was asked to be a professor at Wheaton College and at Fuller Theological Seminary. She turned both of those down because she felt like her calling was to do Christian education and to minister to college-age students. And ultimately, there was this holistic way of life that she cast a vision for people in the beginning of the 20th century to see not just in the workplace, not just in ways of service, but even in their recreational activities that they could be followers of Jesus Christ. She was one of those people that was serious and lighthearted at the same time, that she gave people a reminder that God longs to be someone who is the center of every area of our life. And we talk about being a church at work, but what does it also mean for us to be a church at play? that we look at these opportunities as we spend time together laughing and dancing and rejoicing, sharing meals with one another, as we go on vacation, as we enter into the areas of our life that are like hobbies and pastimes to us. Those, those moments are actually opportunities to continue to cultivate a relationship with Jesus Christ. Imagine in your own life, if you saw not just Sundays, not just this hour in worship, but what if you began to see not just your workplace as an opportunity to live out your faith, first with your life and then after with your words, but also you began to see every moment as an opportunity to serve others, to lift other people up, whether it's people that work for you or you work for, whether it's your coworkers, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a roommate, maybe it's a member of your family that you would be somebody that would be about lifting up and establishing other people. In fact, Henry and his life was all about that. 
You know, a lot of people have heard about names like Bill Bright and Billy Graham and Jim Rayburn and on and on and on. However, a few people have heard about Henrietta Mears. And yet all of these people looked at her as being one of the most influential, not just women, but people that they had ever known in their Christian faith. She modeled this. And even in her life, she would go on vacations. And on those vacations that God used her in profound ways to be part of what God was doing in the world. In fact, it was actually in 1946, February 17th, that she took her first and only major sabbatical. And for an entire year, she stepped back from vocational ministry and her and her sister traveled the world. From February 17th, 1946 to February 17th, 1947. During the course of that time, she traveled to dozens and dozens and dozens of countries around the globe, both Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere. In fact, she was one of the first American civilians, listen to this, to set foot on European soil before President Truman actually called the end of World War II. Six weeks prior to that, on December 31st, she actually experienced stepping onto European soil and she was one of the first Americans, not part of the military, but a civilian to see firsthand the ravages of that war. And she came back home with a renewed fervor. There was this intensity. There was this renewed passion that she saw this great urgency of how important the work that the church was called to do. And in that era of 1947 on, that's when Forest Home was launched. In fact, that same year was when Fuller Seminary began. And over the course of that, many historians and many biographers, and again, I'd love for you to be able to read this, for you to know uh, more about her life. She had this remarkable reality in this quote that exemplified her fifth and final point for her life. The fifth point being to bring people to recognize the Lordship of Christ. We began with Savior, we're ending with Lord. She says this, we are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is the first thing she said when she came back from Europe. Back at Hollywood, she said, and we must present the full doctrine of Christian truth. God is looking for men and women of total commitment, not partial commitment, total commitment. As her biographer said, she spoke frankly about the consequences of such total commitment by reminding the audience of those wartime volunteers known as expendables who gave their lives in service to a greater cause. You see, there was the military, but there were volunteers. They were known as expendables. And she took that ideal and she said this. She drove home the unmistakable parable, we must be expendables for Christ. I'll repeat her words again. We must be expendables for Christ. Then she issued a solemn warning. If we fail God's call to us, we will be held responsible. There were many people in attendance on that night. And one of those was the name Louis Evans Jr. Louis Evans Jr. and Colleen Townsend, that actress, had begun dating Louis Evans Jr. was the son of a very prominent Presbyterian pastor, Louis Evans Sr. And he was a uh, leader within the college department at First Presbyterian Hollywood. And it was in that moment, on that night, during that message, and she had just come back from Europe saying we must be expendables for Christ. He asked the question that changed his life forever. And he said, if we fail or he said this, what could happen if we, the members of the college department, really, truly, wholly gave our lives to Christ? That set Louis Evans Jr. on a trajectory where that night he gave his life wholly to Jesus. And in 1947, he began to follow in profound ways what it meant to have Jesus not just as Savior, but also as Lord. And ultimately, it was nine years later, in 1956, that Louis Evans Jr. was called to be the founding pastor of a little church called Bel Air Presbyterian Church. He and Colleen Townsend 
had just been married. They'd had their first child. The first gathering on April 8th, 1956, in the family room of their home. Ultimately, the purchase of this property and the building of Evans Chapel, which is named after them, had its first worship service in December of 1961 ultimately led to this 22-acre campus and the building of this sanctuary. And ultimately, for me, as the senior pastor, to know that I actually, as a college student of all things, came to Christ through the ministry of Bel Air Presbyterian Church. And I think about that moment in my life where I was on a beach down in San Diego where I remember praying, Jesus, I want to give all of my life to you. I receive you as my Savior, but I also want you to be my Lord. Wherever you want to take me, I'll follow. And I find myself now in this moment, nine years in of being the senior pastor of Bel Air Church, a church that has served the city of Los Angeles and beyond for 67 years, a church that has its origin long before Louis Evans Jr., but has its origin in the heart and ministry of the mother of this church, Henrietta Mears. I am so thankful for how faithful she was, how she stepped up and responded to the call of God on her lives. And I want to leave you with this. No matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, I want you to hear one of the favorite passages that Henrietta Mears had in calling people into full-time vocational ministry. And that could look like anything. It could be as a student. It could be as a teacher. It could be as a mother. It could be as a father. It could be as a script writer. It could be as a director. You can be in full-time ministry, whether you are unemployed or not, or formally receiving a paycheck from a local church. Ministry is about more than just a building. If you were part of the church, you were called to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she reminded so many people in that commissioning through Joshua chapter 1. This is after Moses had died. The great leader was no more. And God was looking for the next generation to step up and to receive a calling, to step into that calling. This is Joshua 1. It says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. As I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river and river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. So therefore be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. For you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. On this day and every day, know that you are not only loved, but you are lifted up and called to a life of great ministry, of great impact. Say yes like Henrietta did. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you call every single one of us to yourself and you call us for a purpose, to be your hands and feet, lights in a dark world. May we be people that enter in, that don't retreat. May we not be people of judgment, but may the center and circumference of our life be found in you, Jesus. It's in your matchless and mighty name we pray. Amen.
Well, friends, again, thank you for this hour in worship that you've chosen to join. Next week, we'll be returning to our series in the book of Revelation. If you go to YouTube and get caught up on those, it's called The Sound of Many Waters. And while you're online, I want you to explore our YouTube channel, subscribe to that, follow us on social media. And as always, as you go to our website and you see the many resources, if you're not yet receiving our weekly newsletter, please go to bellair.org forward slash connect. All the new things that are happening throughout the week, no matter where you live, can be found there. And may God bless you in the week ahead as we collectively follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. We'll see you soon.